Hi, my name is Edward, and today I'm on the couch with a set of neurons in a process called neurotransmission. I'm here to talk about brain cells and how they interact with each other to create brain activity inside of our brains. In this video, I'll cover three things. First, I'll explain how the basic process of neurotransmission works. Second, I want to point out three specific aspects of, of that process. And third, I'll explain what happens in these processes during addiction. Inside of our brains, we have millions and millions of neurons, and these neurons can connect with each other in a variety of ways, and this is how they create neural pathways. Right now, I'm going to talk about how those connections are made. Like I said earlier, on the couch with me, I have a set of neurons in a state of neurotransmission. Um, you probably can't see this uh, pretty well right now from this angle, so I'm going to switch over to, uh, to a better picture so you can actually see uh, what's on here. Communication and activity between neurons is what they call electrochemical. What this means is that an electrical signal is being sent through and is transferred into a, into a chemical, a neurotransmitter, and that neuro, neurotransmitter then stimulates electrical activity in the next neuron. There's always uh, a sending neuron and a receiving neuron, which I uh, will call a, uh, the first neuron and the second neuron in, uh, in this illustration. Every neuron has a set of axons, which are like tails or tentacles that they can use to connect with other neurons. Uh, when they do connect with another, another neuron, the process of neurotransmission is started. Uh, what happens then is that uh, a synaptic cleft is, uh, is created, as you can see here. Uh, the middle is the synapse, is a space between the neurons. So I have distinguished three particular spaces. First is the presynaptic uh, part of the uh, of the of the picture which is the first neuron then you have the synapse which is the space between the neurons and then you have the second neuron which is called the post synaptic uh, neuron and which receives the uh, the activity like I said the process of neurotransmission is electrochemical so what happens first is an electrical si signal sent down in the first neuron uh, they call it an action potential and when it is positive electricity flows down and what happens here is that these vesicles here, these little red dots, uh, they start to bind to the edge of the first neuron and they release uh, chemicals into the synaptic space. And what happens then is uh, that neurotransmitter is flooded in through, uh, into the space between these two neurons. At the other end of the synapse, uh, on the second neuron, there are what, there, what are called neurotransmitter receptors. And the neurotransmitter that is present in the, in the synapse uh, it can bind to, uh, to these receptors and when it does uh, creates electrical uh, currents in the second neuron and it may, may or may not stimulate another action potential in the second neuron and that is, this is how uh, the electrical activity goes from electrical to chemical within the synapse and then back to electrical and it may or may not uh, stimulate further activity depending on how, how strong of a uh, binding response there is at the, at the second neuron. Now, after this process is completed, some of the neurotransmitters broken down into, in the cleft itself and some of it may go back into the first neuron, which is a process, process that they call uh, neurotransmitter reuptake. In this way, you can recycle, use the neurotransmitter and use it again later. Alright, now that we have some idea about uh, how neurotransmission works, I want to draw attention to three specific aspects of this process. As you can see, I, I've written down three letters in this uh, picture, an A, a B, and a C, and, that, and I want to use those to refer to three distinct aspects of this process. Uh, the first one, A, refers to the vesicles inside the first neuron. This is uh, what you might call the a neurotransmitter reserve in the first neuron and it's it refers to the amount of neurotransmitter that is uh, available in the first neurons and does it, it doesn't just have to refer to one particular neuron but to all neurons that are uh, sending neurotransmitter inside of your brain second B is uh, simply the amount of neurotransmitter that is being released uh, into the cleft at any given time and finally, C 
refers to the sensitivity and the amount of receptors that are uh, present at the second neuron. In healthy brain chemistry you have plenty of neurotransmitter present in the vesicles of the first neuron. Plus the sensitivity of the receptors in the second neuron are in a healthy balance with the amount of neurotransmitter that is being released into the synaptic space or the cleft. Alright, so far I covered two things. First, I talked about the process of neurotransmission. And second, I distinguished three specific aspects of that process. For the final part of this movie, I want to discuss something that happens during addiction inside of these processes. What science has uncovered is that when you take an addictive substance or when you do an addictive behavior, is that what happens inside of the system is that uh, a large amounts of neurotransmitter are being flooded into, into the synaptic clefts. When large amounts of neurotransmitter are being released in a, inside our brains, uh, the experience that that gives is sort of an emotional high and a rush of like positive emotion, I guess. In the short term, this feels really good, but in the long term, this can have uh, pretty uh, detrimental effects to your uh, emotional health. Classic example of this, of course, is uh, when you drink a lot of alcohol, then the next morning you won't feel so good. And this is just exactly what happens in such a scenario. Now, why do you feel bad? Let's explain the neurological uh, part of the story. I think there are two types of long-term effects. The first one is pretty obvious. It's the hangover, the emotional low after the emotional high. And this one is pretty simple to explain, really, because during the emotional high, you have elevated levels of neurotransmitter uh, going around inside your brain, and this is causing the emotional high. Uh, but it's also uh, depleting the vesicles inside of your uh, first neuron. So your reserves of neurotransmitter are actually being depleted during that time, and because they are being depleted, then afterwards there isn't as much available to release inside of your brain, and you get the emotional high, then the emotional low. Well, that's sort of an immediate long-term effect. There's also uh, a long-term effect that is actually more long-term, it takes longer, and this, and this concerns the neurotransmitter receptors at the second neuron. And what happens is that over time, as, once, as someone habitually uses uh, an addiction to elevate their moods to feel good in the short term, uh, what happens to these uh, receptors is that they get overstimulated by the high doses of neurotransmitter that keep being released inside of these clef clefts in uh, short time periods. And they, what happens is that they get overstimulated and to cope with this overstimulation uh, they downregulate their sensitivity to the neurotransmitter. In other words, you build up a tolerance. You need more neurotransmitter for the same kind of electrical effect and the activity in your brain goes down. There are two ways that your brain does this. First, it reduces the amount of receptors and the sensitivity of those receptors. All in all, it ends in a uh, in sort of reduced sense of emotionality, I guess. Your overall mood when you just go about your everyday life just goes down, it spirals down. You you grow more numb, you get less motivated, and uh, yeah, it, it also depends on what type of drug or what type of activity you do, but overall it's a sort of a, uh, a numb, numbed feeling of emotionality and motivation. This numb sense of emotionality and motivation is uh, it's pretty much a drag to experience, it's, it doesn't feel good, and it makes you wonder like, why? Why can people get addicted? Why do you, why do we, why can we get addicted? Why? It makes no sense. You feel good in the short term, but afterwards you you experience the crash, the emotional low. Normally, you you would guess that you would learn like, oh wait, this doesn't work. But for some reason, we just get hooked. I think we get hooked by addiction is when we feel weak, when we just want to feel better in the short term and we don't think so much about the long term consequences of it. And we may regret it later, as most people do, like, but they keep relapsing, they keep relapsing. And you think, why? Because the emotionality keeps getting worse. 
and when you don't when you can't stand that emotional low then you're going to keep grabbing towards that substance or that behavior that's going to make you feel better in the short term and it's sort of a vicious cycle that just keeps worsening and worsening until until it gets out of control or maybe it doesn't get out of control you sort of keep going with it but you never feel quite satisfied with with the fact that you well with the fact that you're hooked it's as simple as that and I think there's great power in that just owning up to the fact that you're hooked I mean what else is there to do you know you gotta be real with this in the end I think we like to do these things simply because we want to feel good as, as human beings we just want to feel good the downside is that with these types of addictive behaviors and substances you only feel good in the short term and it doesn't work in the long term I think subconsciously all of us know that but just we just keep going with it or we just take it for granted that we get an emotional low afterwards and some people get totally out of control with it others learn to live with it but I just think it's it's something that you could totally live without and just being honest about it and just looking at your life like where you're hooked on things if you're honest about it and you're authentic about it it gives you some power to to quit to stop doing it and I think being honest about these types of things is the first step to quitting them uh, being honest about them is one thing and I also think that understanding uh, the fundamental uh, processes that happen inside your brain helps you to understand yourself why you do these types of things and uh, also help you to quit if you want to of course <laughs> I think that's uh, the bottom line you have to want to you have to want to quit else this is pretty much irrelevant anyway I uh, want to thank you for watching and I uh, hope you enjoyed this video and uh, hope to speak to you again sometime soon Peace.